Hello everyone and thanks for joining us for this presentation on the dietary management of eosinophilic esophagitis. My name is Vicky McWilliam and I'm a paediatric allergy dietitian based at the Children's Hospital in Melbourne. I also do research as part of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, also based at the Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And I also have a private practice that I do from the um, Max Medical Group um, based in Melbourne as well. So with this presentation, um, I'm going to go through the, the background of the dietary management of eosinophilic esophagitis, the use of the, the, the different types of diets that we use um, as part of the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis, how the diets have kind of evolved and changed over the years because there's been a lot of change in this space in recent years, some of the practical aspects of, around um, eliminating certain foods out of the diet and where some of the challenges may come in. And finally, just some of the future directions around the dietary management of eosinophilic esophagitis. So we know um, that eosinophilic esophagitis can present with different symptom patterns depending on the age of the person. So for younger children, um, compared to older children and adolescents and then compared to adults, we see a different spectrum of symptoms um, that can, can be a clue as to um, eosinophilic esophagitis being an issue. So usually in younger children, we see feeding difficulties, feeding aversions, persistent vomiting, or we might see poor weight gain. In older children and adolescents that may have had undiagnosed EOE for a, a longer period of time, and are also better at verbalising their symptoms, we'll often see them complaining of abdominal pain or chest pain. They'll describe difficulty with swallowing. They'll often be children that are slow eaters, so they sit at the table for a long time, often being the last person to finish eating meals. They often need to drink um, while they're eating to help food move down the esophagus a lot easier. Um, and they'll often be avoiding harder to swallow foods. So these might be children that report um, refusing to eat sandwiches or um, pieces of um, hard meat. And also we can see growth concerns um, in this age group. With adults, however, they're often more likely to have had undiagnosed EOE for quite a long, long period of time, often all through their later childhood and into adulthood. So they've often got a history of long-standing reflux. And these will be people who tend to present more with food impaction. So the esophagus has been so affected by eosinophilic esophagitis um, that that food is starting to get stuck. So the spectrum of symptoms that we see, often um, these particular symptom management patterns can be areas that dietitians have to help patients um, with as well. So even before eosinophilic esophagitis is diagnosed or while we're trying to get a diagnose sorted out, um, dietitians will often be helping families with children that have difficulty with their weight gain or they may have particular fussy eating issues or limited diets because of the symptoms that they have of undiagnosed EOE. So even before we get started, um, a dietitian can sometimes be an important person or is already involved with families because of the symptoms of EOE. We know that there are a few different treatment options available for eosinophilic esophagitis. So we now know that the proton pump inhibitor medications that we use for reflux, if we use those in higher doses, they can actually have an anti-inflammatory property um, that can benefit patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. We know that we can do elimination diets, that, um, that certain foods can be triggers of eosinophilic esophagitis. So excluding those foods from the diet might be a way that people can successfully manage their EOE symptoms. We know that a lot of patients will get managed with um, swallowed or um, steroid slurries to treat their EOE. And we've also got um, patients who have a, um, esophageal dilatation or that the use of biological agents as part of their treatment pattern. And sometimes patients will be on a combination of a couple of these different treatment options, or they might try one treatment option and then swap on to another. Um, but mostly um, the families that I work with in a paediatric setting, they will often be very keen to do a limit to explore whether um, foods or diet is a trigger for their um, children's eosinophilic esophagitis without having to use um, ongoing medications long term. So it's very common for particularly children um, and adolescents um, to be exploring whether they have dietary triggers for their AOE. The dietary treatments for EOE, unfortunately, we don't have an allergy test at the moment to identify the trigger foods for EOE. So we get left with an elimination diet process, which is basically removing the food out of the diet. 
for a period of time to see if the inflammation and the symptoms improve. And we monitor the symptoms using a repeat gastroscopy. So this is a very important aspect because um, it, it's hard for us to see what AOE is doing unless we actually go in and do a scope. So it's very important that, um, that when we're doing the elimination diets that we're doing this in conjunction with follow-up scopes to be able to see whether the diets have had an effect. If removing certain foods from the diet shows that the eosinophilic esophagitis is responding, then we need to do a challenge phase where we bring those foods back in and we see whether the symptoms have flared up again and whether there's active um, eosinophilic esophagitis shown on the gastroscopies again. And then once we've worked out what foods are potential triggers for someone's eosinophilic esophagitis, we do what's called a maintenance phase. So this is where we would work out what the food is that's triggering the EOE, and we would help the patients to work out how they leave that out of their diet and they avoid that in, a, in an ongoing and long-term way. And by doing this, we need to make sure that we replace what we're taking out with foods that are nutritionally um, equivalent so that we're not removing any important nutrients out of the diet. The diets used and the challenge phase can vary between doctors and hospitals. So there's no one standard way to do this. And even within the one hospital, often different gastroenterologists or different allergists will have different approaches to how they manage eosinophilic esophagitis. So whether they do diet first or they try certain medications first or what foods they try um, as a starting point can all vary quite a bit from hospital to hospital. The diets that we use in EOE have evolved quite a bit over time. So we first knew that food had a role to play in eosinophilic esophagitis way back in the 80s when patients with eosinophilic esophagitis were placed on special um, amino acid formula based diets. So limited or um, no food at all and exclusively drinking these particular formulas or having them through um, a nasogastric tube. And we, we were able to find that a good proportion, around 90% of patients could go into remission with their EOE when they took these particular formulas. But these formulas don't taste great and it was, wasn't very easy for people to be able to stick to um, having very limited foods in their diet and relying solely on these formulas as a long-term management for their EOE. So the next step was people thought, well, maybe we could use the allergy testing that we use for other types of allergies to identify the particular foods that might be responsible for triggering EOE. So the next phase of um, diet treatment that we did in EOE was using the allergy testing um, to identify the particular foods that we would take out of the diet. But what we actually found was the allergy testing was not very good at identifying the particular foods that were responsible for EOE. So we moved on to then just doing standard elimination diets that took out the common allergens that we know exist in, the, in our food supply. So milk, egg, wheat, nuts, um, fish and shellfish and soy were the common um, six to eight foods that were often taken out. So the six to eight really refers to the six foods is if we don't count fish and shellfish as two separate foods and peanuts and tree nuts as two separate foods. So um, the common um, top eight allergens are usually removed for that particular diet. Over time though, we've learnt that for most people with eosinophilic esophagitis, not all of those six to eight foods are actually responsible for very many patients EOE. And most patients, um, we found that they could eliminate a, a smaller amount of foods um, and the diets didn't need to be quite so restrictive because we really learnt that milk, soy, egg and wheat were probably the biggest um, triggers of EOE and nuts and fish and shellfish played um, a very um, uncommon role in EOE. And we've extended that even further now to finding that most patients um, could probably start off with a milk and wheat or milk and wheat together as the first step. And if they don't respond to those two levels of exclusion, then we can escalate um, the levels of exclusion on top of those um, as we move forward. But the bulk of patients would probably be able to be identified as being milk or wheat um, responsive um, with their EOE. So as you can see over time, the diets have changed quite a lot and quite rapidly um, to 
formula-based diets to using allergy testing to having quite extensive amount of foods taken out of the diet to now a lot of um, gastroenterologists and allergists may actually just start families off on milk and wheat or milk and wheat together um, as a starting point for the exclusion diets that we use. The other thing that's really important to remember is most people will only have one food trigger, but for many people, there's also um, unusual foods or less common foods that will be a trigger of their EOE. So corn, potato, certain meats will sometimes see with, with patients with EOE. So although this is a common pathway, that these are the common allergens that we'll often take out as a starting point, we sometimes get stuck with certain patients that we need to dig a little deeper and look at the diet in a bit more detail to really um, pinpoint what foods might be driving their AOE. So we went through this in a little bit of detail before, but I just wanted to go through what the elimination diet process looks like and what the journey would be like if you were embarking on doing um, an elimination diet to try and, and work out what food triggers you had for your AOE. So it's important that we start off with a baseline scope. So we need um, a gastroscopy done by a gastroenterologist to make sure that we get the diagnosis of EOE done properly from the start. So even though we know that food can be a very common trigger of EOE for very many, uh, for a lot of patients, we don't start the diet unless we have a proper diagnosis made by a gastroenterologist with that scope. The diet then needs to be done for a reasonable period of time. So usually eight to 10 weeks is the period of time that we would do the diets for. And ideally, if we have really good access to um, gastroscopies, then we would do the diet for the eight to 10 weeks and then have a repeat gastroscopy done to see whether there's been a response to the diet. If there hasn't been a response to the diet, then we may need to look at eliminating different foods or more foods from the diet, or this might be a particular family or a particular patient where moving on to medication as a treatment for their AOE would be something that the doctors discuss with them. If there has been a response to the diet that we've chosen, then the process here is to then try and pinpoint which foods out of those that we've taken out of the diet are the real triggers of the AOE. So we would normally reintroduce the foods back in one at a time. And ideally we would do scopes um, after the reintroduction of each one of those foods. Um, we'll often keep um, food diaries and symptom diaries during this process. And although symptoms aren't 100% reliable as to what's going on inside the esophagus, and it's hard to know without actually doing a scope, they can still sometimes help give us an idea, um, particularly for older children and adults, um, as to how the esophagus is feeling. And once we've identified the foods that we're pretty confident are the triggers for the AOE, we would then take those um, foods out of the diet in a long-term way and make sure that we're replacing them with equivalent um, nutrition so that we're not missing out on anything important in the diet. Important things to um, think about with the elimination diet process is, as you can see from that um, little um, discussion of the journey, it's quite a long drawn out process. So you will need a dietitian to help. So if, if your gastroenterologist or your allergist is um, talking to you about exploring food um, as a trigger for um, your EOE, then it is a really good idea to get a referral to a dietitian and get some help with doing the diet properly. You want to make sure that you're not wasting your time. It's a very um, complicated, um, difficult process. So you want to make sure that if you embark on the diet that you do it properly and that when you're doing your scope that you've done the diet properly and we're really measuring what is happening without those foods in the diet. A dietitian can help you work out what food is okay to eat. So it's not about what's take, what we're taking out of the diet, but dietitians are really good at telling you what you can put in instead, help you with recipes, help you with brands of breads and breakfast cereals, etc. what to pack into lunch boxes. They can also help with the fussiness and texture issues that are common with EOE. So um, we, we often see a lot of feeding aversions and feeding problems in children who have AOE. So dietitians, um, particularly paediatric dietitians, will have particular skills um, to be able to help you with that as well. They can also help tailor the diet for what you like to eat and your lifestyle. So the sorts of foods that you will commonly eat, where you like to eat takeaway, what things you do as a family, what restaurants you like to go to, a dietitian will help you put the diet together based on what you do as a family. 
Importantly, we also make sure that the long-term diet is nutritionally adequate, so you're not missing out on anything, particularly um, calcium if you're removing um, cow's milk products and soy from the diet. So I'm just going to go through each of the things that we commonly um, remove from the diet when we're exploring whether um, foods are a trigger for AOE and just go through some of the nutritional concerns that we have when we're doing when we're removing those particular foods. So for milk, milk and products made from milk are really important source of calcium, protein, fat, particularly for infants, um, children and adolescents. So for cow's milk or um, soy infant formula in children that are less than one to two years of age, we would normally um, place these children on a specialised formula if they're under two years of age and we're needing to remove cow's milk from the diet. Because most of the alternative milks that are on the market, such as oat milk, rice milk, um, the nut milks, etc., are not high enough in protein and fat to be an adequate um, replacement for um, a baby formula in their diets. There are alternative um, yogurts and cheeses and ice cream that are on the market as well. Um, there are only a limited range of brands of yogurt that actually have calcium added into them. So for most of these foods that are listed here, they're really just a practical replacement for dairy products um, or, or products made from milk in the diet. And you really need some help from a dietitian to make sure that you're picking a milk replacement and the brands of alternative yogurts that would be providing some calcium to the diet to make sure that you're getting enough calcium in. And often if we can't get there, we may need to um, add a calcium supplement into um, the mix, particularly for um, those patients that we identify that milk is a trigger of their AOE and we're going to be leaving dairy products out of their diet long term. We will often pop them onto a calcium supplement, particularly through adolescence, because that's a, a time when um, there's a lot of um, skeletal bone growth happening and a lot of um, laying down of calcium stores is happening over that time. So it's a really important time to make sure we're getting enough calcium in. So a dietitian will be able to look really closely at the diet, give you specific brand names of milk alternatives and yogurts that are going to provide calcium and check that against the requirements at different ages to make sure that we're getting everything in that we need. When we're avoiding wheat, um, this can be really confusing because there's a difference between um, gluten-free versus wheat-free. And in Australia, we tend for eosinophilic esophagitis to only avoid um, wheat and wheat-based um, wheat products. And we don't advise that you have to avoid products that contain um, gluten. So gluten is one of the proteins that is present in wheat but it's also present in some other grains. Um, and it's gluten that we recommend um, being avoided for people who have celiac disease. It's gluten um, that is that causes the damage to the small intestine um, in celiac disease. But for eosinophilic esophagitis in Australia, um, we only avo advise avoiding um, wheat as a grain, and we would still let um, oats be included in the diet, for example, and um, rye we would still use as well. So this table just goes through um, the alternatives. If we were removing wheat from the diet, there are a whole heap of other grains that we can actually use when we're following a wheat-free diet. So you can see the list there um, in alphabetical order of the alternative grains that you can buy pastas and bread and cereals, um, crackers. Um, you can buy all of those as alternatives to use while you're doing a wheat-free diet. Um, where things get tricky is um, a lot of the wheat-free products or the gluten-free products that are available um, will often contain um, egg or milk or other ingredients that we might be avoiding if we're doing um, an extensive multiple food exclusion diet. So the label reading can be really important and making sure that you're getting the right brand names for breads, etc., um, can be quite important. So again, this is where a dietitian can be really helpful to work out what breads to use, what breakfast cereals, um, what um, recipes and stuff will be um, suitable to use. When we're avoiding egg, the nutrition that is in egg is um, very similar to what's in meat, fish and legumes. So they're a source of um, particularly iron and protein. But if children are eating, if people are eating other sources of those nutrients from meat or fish or legumes, then taking the egg out of the diet is often not a nutritional issue. 
but egg is in a lot of products and it is a very important ingredient in a lot of our baked goods. So usually going through with families how to replace an egg in a recipe like a cake, or if you're making a recipe that has egg as a binding ingredient in it, like a patty or a burger, um, we can go through with them what alternatives um, are available to have the same function as an egg in the recipe um, when you're baking. So um, there's some examples that are listed on this slide of some of the things that we would recommend for different recipes um, when avoiding egg. With soy, um, unless the patient is frequently consuming soy-based products such as soy milk or soy sauce or tofu, um, restricting soy in the diet is also less of an issue from a nutritional point of view. But if we're taking milk, cow's milk and soy out of the diet at the same time, then this will really limit the milk replacement options that we have available to us. So we're left with really using a rice, oat, um, one of the nut milks or a coconut milk as a milk replacement. Um, and normally with soy avoidance, we do still allow soy oil and soy lecithin. So soy lecithin is a common um, emulsifier that's used in a lot of commercial food products. So they're two ingredients that we off that we will still leave in when we're doing soy avoidance for eosinophilic esophagitis. And letting patients know that can often open up their diet quite substantially with what commercial food products they can use. The trick then is if we're not if we're doing anything more than milk wheat, soy and egg avoidance, how do we work out um, what other food triggers might potentially be in someone's diet? So exploring things like corn as a trigger or a certain meat like chicken or potato as a trigger, this can get really tricky and there are also not um, mandatory ingredients that needed to be declared on, on ingredient lists on food packaging. So it can make it really difficult sometimes to um, pinpoint and avoid um, other foods other than those common allergens in the diet. So the way we'd normally approach this is we would do a food and symptom diary um, and try and see whether we can see any patterns with consumption of certain foods with certain ingredient bases in them and any symptoms. This is a very unreliable way of trying to track what's going on with EOE, but when we have limited options available, it's often a, a good starting point. Another thing we may do is we may strip the diet right back to a very few amount of foods or even use um, a specialised infant, a specialised formula for a short period of time and see whether we can get the EOE um, into remission by doing that and then adding foods back in sequentially one at a time to see if we can pinpoint um, any outlying unusual food triggers. But often once you get outside the realm of the common allergens, it can be very tricky sometimes to pinpoint what the other food triggers are um, for AOE. But we do see patients that have other foods other than milk and wheat and soy and egg um, as their triggers of their AOE. So what are some of the unknowns um, with dietary um, exploration and use of diet in AOE? We still don't really know what cereal grains need to be eliminated. So some countries do completely gluten-free and um, some countries just do wheat exclusion. So that really hasn't been um, fully explored and researched properly at, to this point. We also don't know the amount of exposure that can induce a response. So we don't know how strict we need to be with the elimination of these particular proteins out of the diet, particularly long-term. We may be able to have small amounts of these foods in the diet. Um, and they may not be um, responsible for flaring up AOE, but this has never been explored yet. We also really don't know the length of the dietary elimination that's needed. So the guidelines say somewhere between eight to 12 weeks for um, that initial exclusion diet that we need to do to work out whether diet is a trigger of AOE, um, but whether we can shorten that for, um, you know, down to a shorter time frame is something that hasn't really been well explored either. Where do we need to go for more information? So if you're recently engaging um, in um, the experience of EOE and, and new to um, this journey, then the places to go for good information are um, Aussie. So this is a charity that's dedicated to improving the lives of people affected by all uh, the full range of eosinophilic disorders, but eosinophilic esophagitis is included in that. It's a good place to go for up-to-date um, research and information about what's happening um, in AOE, the new treatment options that are available, 
Um, and there's also a really good repository of um, recipes that you can access, um, which is a fantastic resource for families, particularly those that are eliminating multiple foods out of the diet. Um, this is a really, um, really good resource for them. So I would encourage becoming a member of Aussie. There's also um, a partnership through Aussie with um, other um, international groups that are looking at doing combined research. So they're looking at surveying people who have um, eosinophilic esophagitis and other eosinophilic um, gastro disorders um, and gathering data um, live from patients as they're progressing through their journey of um, eosinophilic esophagitis. So registering to be part of this um, is a really valuable way to contribute to the research and um, help us understand a little bit more about what's going on and improve the care for people moving forwards. The other place to go for reliable information regarding eosinophilic esophagitis is ASCIA. So ASCIA is the Australian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergies. So they're the peak allergy body in Australia and New Zealand. They have an information sheet that describes what eosinophilic esophagitis is. Um, and we also have some resources coming. Um, there's going to be an action plan like we have for other types of allergic disease that you would be able to complete, um, have your doctor complete and then use that for childcare and schools to, um, to document what particular food triggers your child has for their EOE and formalise that dietary restriction that you need to um, have followed in those, in those settings. And we've also got some resources being developed that are nearly ready for launch. Um, for access for dietitians who are wanting to do the four or the two food elimination diets um, with their patients. So these are exciting resources that are nearly ready to be released. What about the future for EOE and diet? Um, I think some of the exciting things that are in the wings is we're gonna have better testing methods, hopefully, to determine the triggers of EOE. So we may be at the point where we might be able to have um, a blood test or um, testing that is not reliant on um, gastroscopies to work out what's going on with EOE. Um, we're starting to understand better those patients that may respond to dietary um, elimination in EOE, so having a better understanding of the patients that could go straight to dietary therapy or those patients that might need to go to proton pump inhibitor therapy as their best line of treatment. So that is uh, um, stuff that is evolving. There's also lots of um, less invasive assessments that um, are starting to be used in the clinic. So um, instead of having to go under a um, anaesthetic to have a gastroscopy done, um, there's other alternatives now, um, string tests and cytosponges um, that um, are alternatives to having the traditional gastroscopies being done, which is exciting. There's more information coming out about the elimination diets and tailoring those better um, and and making them more precise um, and, and having a better understanding of what's going on there. That's an area that has evolved already quite dramatically, but we're understanding a lot more about how to, how to apply the diets better in EOE. And maybe down the track, like other types of allergy, we may be able to desensitize people to um, the, their triggers, whether they're foods or environmental allergens. Um, that may be a possibility for people with eosinophilic esophagitis. And there's um, biological um, medications that are um, on the horizon as well. So things are changing a lot um, in this space. Um, and we know for a lot of patients that um, EOE um, is a complex allergic disorder. Um, and it is very tricky sometimes to get a diagnosis and, and work out what the best treatment options are for particular patients. But we do know that food can be a trigger. Um, but it's really important to get a definitive diagnosis before exploring what, um, what role food plays in your AOE. So even though we know that food can be a trigger, we need to make sure that we've um, had a gastroenterologist make the definitive diagnosis of AOE before we launch into doing any dietary restrictions. If you're wanting to um, go down the road of doing dietary restrictions and exploring diet as a trigger of EOE, it's important to insist on a dietitian to help with the diet. So the elimination diet process is challenging and it can be quite confusing and you don't want to be doing the diet um, um, without the proper help and doing it properly and then having scopes done that are a waste of time because you've accidentally left um, some of the particular proteins in the diet, etc. 
and join your support organisations as they're a fantastic way of keeping on top of what's new in this area and all the practical things that will make your life easier. So recipes and new products, etc. They're a really invaluable resource um, and a way to engage with other families and other patients. So I thank